No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks again for being with us. And at all, as always, let me tell you what's coming your way on today's program. We'll, of course, begin with our devotional time consisting of scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. Today, we're looking at Romans chapter 12. We'll look at verses 1 through 3. So if you don't have your Bibles already opened, do so now to Romans 12, 1 through 3. And uh, we'll be studying together from that passage in just a few moments after I tell you what else is coming your way on today's program. After our devotional time, Cody's Corner comes your way with Cody Boston. And uh, today he's going to be talking about the wayside soil, the wayside soil. And then following Cody's Corner, it'll be walking and talking in the light with Freddie Clayton. You remember walking and talking through Proverbs, that excellent series. Well, we've moved on from Proverbs to just walking and talking in, in the light from various aspects of Scripture. And uh, today we'll be dealing, Freddie will be dealing with the subject of miracles. What does the Bible say about the miraculous? You will not want to miss that. Our final segment today is our GNT Q and A. Do we know the time of Christ's second coming? Do we know the time of Christ's second coming? We'll answer that, as we always do, from the Word of God. Thanks so much for being with us. We hope you have your Bibles open now to Romans chapter 12, as we read from verses 1 through 3, where Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one of us, or to each one, a measure of faith. back for the study portion of our devotional time. And we hope you have your Bible still open to Romans 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. And Paul begins this part of his epistle to uh, the Christians at Rome with this uh, plea, I beseech you. The, the idea there is I beg you. I am imploring you, brethren, therefore, uh, by the mercies of of God. Now, the therefore takes us back uh, just a little bit, as we uh, often say, when you see therefore, look and see what it's there for. And so you go back to uh, uh, the previous verse, for of him and through him and to him 
uh, are all things to whom be glory for ever. And so based upon the, the, the wonderful blessings that Christians enjoy in Christ as a result of being in Christ, then there should be more, in other words, more than ample motivation to make a presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice. So therefore, we come back to this plea in verse 12. I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, and notice the basis upon which he does this, by the mercies of God. In other words, based upon all the things he's enumerated, not only in this epistle, but throughout his writings, and the things that are enumerated throughout the New Testament, the bountiful blessings that belong to those who are in Christ as a result of the marvelous, matchless grace of God in the giving of His only begotten Son to make possible our salvation from sin. How motivated should we be to respond to that love with a reciprocal love? Well, John summarizes that for us, as a matter of fact, in 1 John four nineteen, when he writes, we love Him because He first loved us us. We love Him because He first loved us. And there are numerable reminders of that love and the blessings that God through Christ has bestowed upon us. So, therefore, by these mercies, Paul writes, I beseech you, I beg you, that you present your bodies. Now, the present here is in a tense that indicates laying it all on the line once and for all. Make a Make a once-for-all commitment and then live in harmony with that commitment. You know, it's kind of like we talk about uh, attendance at, uh, at worship. Uh, and it was, uh, I think, attributed to the late uh, uh, gospel preacher Gus Nichols many years ago who uh, talked about uh, attendance and whether or not I decide on a particular Sunday or whatever time the church is meeting, Will I decide then on each occasion whether I will go or not? I think his point, as I remember it was, I made that decision when I became a Christian. That's when I decided I would be faithful to the Lord in my attendance. Well, that's a good point, isn't it? And that's really kind of the idea of what Paul is saying here. Make that presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. Lay it all on the line and then live in harmony with that and grow in harmony with that commitment. He goes on, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the idea of reasonable service here is logical. In other words, Christianity is not some wild leap in the dark by so-called faith, as some define that word, and that's not a proper biblical definition of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is based on evidence. Faith is not a leap in the dark. And so reasonable service is the idea that we can look at the Scripture and we can see abundant evidence that this book, this book, the Bible, is like no other book. It is obviously inspired of God. Everything, therefore, that it enjoins upon me to do as a Christian or to become a Christian is something that I can take as authoritative and that I must do, and I can reason it out and see the logic, and I can see the reason. It's reasonable. It's logical. It's logical. It presents itself, the Scripture does, as being truly like no other book, if we will come to the study of that book with an open mind, with a receptive mind. So it's your reasonable service. Now, verse 2 he says, and do not be conformed. And the tense here indicates stop being conformed. In other words, Christianity, you lay it all on the line, but then obviously you're, you're in a growing process. And a part of that process is to become less and less attached to the things of this world. Don't, don't be conformed to it. In fact, uh, you don't gradually get out of sin either. That's not what Paul is saying here. But make sure that you continue, continue to avoid conformity with the Word, in other words. And you grow in holiness. You grow in sanctification. That's clearly set forth in this Roman epistle as well as elsewhere. So the more we feed upon spiritual things, the more we become like Christ in His image. Uh, the stronger we become, 
the more attached to the things of the next world and, and, and less likely to become conformed to this world. So stop being conformed and be transformed. And that's in the same tense. Keep on being transformed. And that leads to the idea that our holiness or sanctification, and they're one and the same concept, that that's a growing process. And it's dependent upon how we feed ourselves in that process. And if we feed upon the Word of God, if we feed upon every opportunity we have to be with the people of God, to study, to worship, to grow in grace and knowledge, then we are going to continue to be more and more Christ-like every day that we live. You can't just say, I'm stagnant and I've become a Christian. I've been baptized into Christ. I don't need to be concerned about applying myself to growth. Peter denies that when he says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. So we are to continue to grow, keep on being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how is that mind renewed? The Colossian letter says we're renewed in knowledge, in knowledge becoming more like the image of him who created us. So we're renewed in knowledge. Where does that knowledge come from? It comes from the Word of God. Therefore, the transformation process is an ongoing process where we become more Christ-like, but only as we feed upon spiritual things and avail ourselves of the wonderful Word of God. And in so doing this, Paul writes that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God is perfect. And if we will accept it through obedience to it, then we can be complete or whole in Christ Jesus. And as we do that, we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. That's the final verse of our text. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. How does God give us faith today? It's not in some miraculous way. It is through the hearing of the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So what Paul is enjoining here upon these Christians is to lay it all on the line, continue that growth process, be continually transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how is that mind renewed? Through the knowledge of the Word of God. And where is that knowledge found? In the written Word of God, which is all sufficient to guide us into all truth. That's back to a familiar text, which we've quoted often, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the all-sufficient nature of the written Word of God. And as we've said, the new covenant is the covenant to which we are amenable today. Well, that's all the time we have for our devotional time. Right now, it's time to hear Cody Boston in another Cody's Corner as he talks about the Wayside Soil. Here's Cody Boston. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Today I want to talk to you about a very familiar parable. Uh, when you look at plants, you realize that first you must plant the seed for the plant to grow. But part of planting the seed is making sure that you have good soil for the seed to take root and to grow and, and to mature into this uh, beautiful and, and, and big plant. In Matthew chapter 13, we have a parable of the sower that, that's uh, referenced there. And in this parable, we typically come to it and we talk about it and view it from the perspective of the sower, the one planting the seed. What I want to do today is, is I want to ask you to challenge yourself to think about the soil of your heart. We, we know as we study there in Matthew 13 in the, in the text that the soils that are talked about, discussed, they represent the hearts of people. And so what I want you to do is, through the next few minutes, evaluate your heart. If you've tuned in to this segment and you are a regular viewer, typically I would say you do so because you desire to have, as verse 8 mentions in the parable, the good soil. 
You want to have a good heart, a heart that's receptive, a heart that will listen and receive the Word of God and allow it to be planted, a heart that will will produce fruit for the kingdom as God's Word is planted there. And so with that in mind, I want to make sure that you realize the dangers of the other soil so that you can evaluate your own and make it the right kind of heart, make it the good soil for the Word uh, to penetrate. The first soil in Matthew 13 that we uh, have referenced for us is the wayside soil. And if you want to turn to Matthew 13, we're going to read a few verses uh, together for just a moment. So Matthew chapter 13. And picking up in verse 1 of Matthew 13, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to Him, so that He got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. That's where we're going to stop uh, for this particular segment. As you think of the wayside, vineyards in that day, they had these stone walls or these hedges uh, that divided them out. But grain fields didn't have those hedges. Instead, there were these pathways that would divide the grain fields out. And these pathways would be traveled by the sower, would be traveled by animals, to the point that the ground would be very compact and very tough, very hard. So when the sower is out throwing seed in the air to try to cover the ground, some of that seed is going to land on this pathway that's very tough, and it won't be able to get into the, into the soil, into the dirt to grow. This particular soil represents the heart of a person that is very hard. When our hearts are very hard, they refuse to allow the Word of God inside. When we read in Scripture of things that we need to do to please God and it conflicts with things that we are currently doing in our lives, if our heart is hard, we don't listen to Scripture, but we keep living in sin. We don't allow God's Word to penetrate. Thus, we don't allow God's Word to change our lives. This week and and throughout your life, if you desire to have good soil, make sure that you don't become numb to sin, that you don't let sin walk all over your heart to the point that it becomes tough and hard and it refuses to let the Word of God inside. I encourage you, be good soil for the Word of God. Well, that's it from my corner of the world. I hope you have a blessed day. We always appreciate Cody's Corner. Excellent subject matter, the wayside soil. We need to make sure we're not that wayside soil, but that we are the good soil, receptive to the gospel. Well, coming up, it's Walking and Talking in the Light with Freddie Clayton after we take a brief but very important information break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. You know, the subject of miracles, very, very controversial subject, but it shouldn't be if we'll simply stay with what the Word of God teaches about miracles. And that's what Freddie Clayton is going to do right now. He's going to stay right with the Word of God as he talks about miracles in another excellent walking and talking in the light. Here's Freddie Clayton. Welcome. Consider this question. Do miracles occur today? And what does it matter? On Saturday, December the 21st, 2018, two-year-old Olive Elaine unexpectedly passed away. 
In response to her death, her mother went to social media and asked thousands of people to pray for a miracle, a resurrection from the dead for her little girl. Friends, my heart breaks for this mother and father who have lost their little girl. I can only imagine the desperation they must feel. But my heart also breaks for them because of the false hope they have been given by false doctrine. While I believe in miracles, I do not believe the Bible teaches that miracles are intended for all time. The Bible records many miracles. Thus, whether miracles are being performed today or not is not a question of the power of God, but the purpose of God. While God gave men in times past the power to raise the dead, for example, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, also Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4, as well as the Lord himself in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, and as well Peter in Acts chapter 9, verse 36 through 42, and Tabitha or Dorcas. These miraculous gifts, friends, have ceased. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 10 clearly teaches this. And let's look specifically at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect, that is, complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Sometimes when people will ask me this, what does it matter? So what if people think that God still empowers men to perform miracles today? What difference does it really make? Let's briefly answer this question and give a few reasons why it matters. First of all, it matters because truth matters. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, the wise man Solomon says, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. While coming to an understanding of all truth is not essential to be saved, we should never be content with any error but should always live in pursuit of truth. Error, consequential or not, should never be desired over the truth. Secondly, people are vulnerable in times of heartache and loss. This vulnerability has been fertile soil for charlatans who claim advantage to these hurting people and to manipulate them to their own gain. Countless millions of dollars have exchanged hands in desperation and hope for a miracle. The desperation has made millionaires of countless miracle peddlers who do harm to the cause of Christ. Also, consider the potential for disillusionment. What will happen to the faith of this desperate mother and father who have been taught God is still willing to raise the dead when their little girl is not raised? Will they be disillusioned? Will they lose their faith? Will they be angry with God for not doing something he never said he would do? Christians need to pray for this mother and father. They have not only suffered the painful and unexpected loss of the little girl, but they must also deal with the inevitable suffering resulting from their belief in a false doctrine. Pray that their loss will drive them to God's word to search for answers and discover why their miracle wasn't granted. Pray that they may come to an understanding that their hope in their obedience to the gospel, which promises them the reunion they seek with their little girl. And our thanks to Freddie Clayton for his excellent walking and talking in the light. Coming up, it's our GNT Q and A. We mentioned the question earlier: Do we know the time of Christ's second coming? Do we know the time of Christ's second coming? We'll deal with that from the Word of God, as always. After another brief break.
back for our final segment. Before we get to our uh, G&T Q&A today, a brief reminder, we want you to take advantage of all the contact information we have given you and access uh, every opportunity that you have to uh, have uh, good news today through our website at gnttv.org, through truth.fm, and you can go there. We have a 24-7 internet radio station where our content is streaming. You can download our our app and have the latest program there on your smart device, as well as looking at any segment that they're all separated there for you. So we want you to take advantage of the contact information. Here's our GNT Q&A. Do we know the time of Christ's second coming? Well, as we said, there have been many through the years who have predicted the, the time of Christ's coming, and they have all missed it all to this point in time. Why have they missed it? Because they've tried to predict something that the Bible tells us we cannot predict. Well, what's, what's the misunderstanding about? Well, much of it is based upon a misapplication of Matthew 24, where in part of that chapter, Jesus gives signs of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But in verse 36, he answers another of the disciples' question about his questions about his second coming. And there he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. At the time Christ walked the earth, he himself didn't know the time of his coming. And then going on into chapter 25 of Matthew 24, he tells us to be prepared and uses parables to teach about being prepared because we do not know when the bridegroom, the Christ, in other words, is coming. So, no, the scripture does not teach that Christ is going to come again at a specific time. The scriptures abundantly teach we need to be ready because we do not know the day nor the hour. Thanks for being with us for another edition of Good News Today. There is good news today all around the world. Good news, good news, all the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world. Good news, good news, the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.